21 minutes past the hour. It's about time we cross over to a second part, to the second part of this uh, program. And tonight, of course, we're talking about Uganda. You know, Uganda is said to have the best policy towards refugee. The United Nations has described Uganda as one of the best places in the world to be a refugee. And there are reports that uh, Uganda has got into a deal with Israel, where Uganda has accepted to take about 500 Af African asylum uh, seekers. Now, just to tell us more and much more, I'm now joined by my colleague from Kampala, Uganda, who is Solomon Sarawanja. Solomon, good evening. A very good evening to you, Yusuf. Certainly, let me just say this, that the breaking news is that the Netanyahu administration has actually admitted that plans to relocate asylum seekers to Africa and indeed to Uganda have collapsed today. That is a story that has just come in now, which means that all the prior arrangements have been nullified. Today, that statement was made in court and therefore we don't think that, um, you know, that plan to bring about 200 African immigrants to Uganda still stands. Already reports indicate that the team from Israel that had come to Uganda to finalize on that deal went back to Tel Aviv empty-handed. And, uh, of course, that deal was not concluded. So today the best, um, I mean, the, the, it's, I think it's best news for all the African immigrants who have been, been putting a lot of pressure on President Netanyahu, including human rights defenders and growing pressures from the United Nations and other, you know, other countries to tell, uh, demanding that Israel reviews its decision. Certainly these uh, can be described as answered prayers for the African immigrants, Yusuf. Very interesting development there, Solomon, and I'm sure, you know, most Africans, you know, are worried about what uh, the 500 plus refugees will mean for the people of Uganda. But now that you've cleared the air uh, for us, and I understand uh, you have some guests uh, with you for us, and I believe you're going to take care of our discussion tonight, Solomon. All right, so we want to welcome both our national and international audience watching us right now on KTN Bottom Line Africa. We're live from Kampala in Uganda, and we're discussing Uganda's refugee policies and aren't we biting more than we can chew? But first, let's look at the conversations that have been going on on the deportation, not really deportation, but um, Israel deciding, deciding to send African immigrants to Uganda. Previously, there was a negotiating, negotiation that was going on between Rwanda and Israel, but all this also collapsed. Now, joining us tonight on Bottom Line Africa is a seasoned journalist, also investigative journalist, Raymond Mujuni, who has been uh, really, really working hard. He's had an extensive investigative report on the, you know, bringing African immigrants from Israel. Thank you so much, Raymond, for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm glad right. to be here. Good to have you. Mm -hmm. All right. We're also joined by Timothy Kadiejida, a veteran journalist, also political analyst, joining us on Bottom Line Africa. Tim Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good evening. All right. So, Raymond, what is your overview of, you know, Israel's decision, earlier decision? I mean, it was just today that this was recalled, but what do you make of Israel's intention of, you know, bringing African immigrants to Uganda and also to Rwanda? But uh, as you know, the, the Rwanda deal failed, you know. Um, what I can say for a fact is that it's not new. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the attempt to paint it as new again is also, uh, I think, something that's a crafting of the administration. In 2014, Harris newspaper, the Israeli newspaper, together with Uganda Radio Network, where I was working, filed in an Israeli court to find information about a deal between Uganda and Israel that would essentially send 2,000 refugees who are Eritrean and Ethiopian to Uganda, and in exchange, Uganda would get ammunition. Uh, the extensive court process ended up with the discovery in which the Israeli government actually declared that they had entered into negotiations with an African government to repatriate refugees. Um, the court didn't declare which country these refugees were coming, but what we found in 2014 was that there were Eritrean and Ethiopian refugees who left Israel and came to Uganda yeah. and whose tickets were booked by Inbal Insurance Agency. That agency belongs to the Israeli government. Yeah. So the Netanyahu administration, the prime minister of, of Israel, uh, has long held ties with the Uganda administration. His brother died during the raid on Entebbe. Um, the head of the Mossad in the Netanyahu regime when he entered 
Mr. Rafi Eitan is a very good friend of Yuri Kaguta Museveni. He's been photographed with him. He's been seen in meetings with him. And also at the heart of negotiating this deal, he was part of the people that entered that negotiation. And there are court documents to this, uh, to this effect. Ab absolutely. Yes. Another interesting thing that you mentioned in your report is that there was some sort of an arms deal between Israel and Uganda. Yes. Essentially what Uganda was getting in exchange for hosting refugees was would get ammunition from Israel. And, and this is high-tech ammunition that would then go on to be used by the Special Forces Command and uh, other artillery units of, of the country. Um, we also applied to the Uganda government to find information on whether they were buying ammunition from Israel, and they refused to declare that information. But there's a court process of an Israeli arms dealer who came to Uganda who says he had brought ammunition from Israel for Uganda, and he was arrested at the airport. So it's still, there's very little that says it's a gray area. Much of what we found actually says there's an existing deal. It's just that the, both sides need to own up. And uh, two weeks ago, Musa Echweru, our Minister for Disaster Preparedness, actually owned up and said, Uganda has actually negotiated with Israel and had a deal for the repatriation of refugees. If it has fallen through now, it's because of diplomatic tension. Certainly. Mm -hmm. um, Timothy, you look at, there were two possible hosts. We had Rwanda, we had Uganda. Rwanda eventually pulled out. Uganda then said, hey, we're all available. Please bring them in. We'll you know, accommodate them. And then eventually this deal has collapsed. What do you make of this whole, you know, this whole thing going on? You know? Well, it's just part of uh, the historical relations between Israel and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, especially the Christian-leaning Sub-Saharan African countries, going back to the 1960s, if you wish, the late 1950s, if you can go that far back. In fact, my only surprise in all this is that Kenya is not involved. Uh, there's always been the tendency, especially since, well, you know, the, the Six-Day War in Israel, Israel, that beleaguered country in the Middle East, always in need of allies wherever you can find them, high and low. And Africa, as I say, especially these Christian countries in Eastern Africa that want to punch above their weight, um, have been the low-hanging fruit. So uh, Israel essentially funneled arms to the SPLA in, 19, in the late 1960s. Uh, they were fighting for what eventually became a South Sudanese state against uh, the mostly Islamic uh, North Sudan. And that was seen as a buffer. Kenya was the landing logistical point of the Israeli commander rescue mission in Uganda in July 1976, and so on. So there's always been this relationship between Israel and these countries that benefits Israel in, in situations like the votes in the general assembly in the, in the United Nations also becomes a listening intelligence post, if you may, uh, for Israel in this region to watch countries when they were more radical like Sudan, Egypt, the waters of the Nile, and that sort of thing, the geopolitical interests of Israel in this area. And then these same countries also w trying to punch above the weight, discovering the headlines that it makes, and also the, I guess, degree of leverage they get by intertwining their foreign and military policy with Israel. Yeah. So essentially, that's, that's the background to all this, of which this is just the latest. I mean, in 1984, 1985, there was Operation Solomon, the secret Israeli airlifting of the so-called Falasha Jews, the Ethiopians of, they say, Judaic origins, or at least belief in Ethiopia to Israel, the ones, the black uh, Israelis today. So this really is just another milestone. And perhaps the question is, the United Nations tried to negotiate with uh, the Netanyahu administration to at least take the African immigrants to Europe, and yet he saw Africa again as, you know, the best reception. Yes, Africa itself, as I say, what do we lose? I mean, already Uganda could be, I don't know if it's still second after Tanzania, but it's basically one of the two countries with the highest number of uh, refugees in Africa, could have overtaken Tanzania now. So, as I say, Uganda, very much in the mold of Rwanda, countries which since the early 1990s, Uganda and Rwanda in particular, have tried to essentially project them 
themselves as regional players, small economies, yeah. but then by dedicating themselves to peacekeeping missions in, let's say, South Sudan, Central African Republic, Somalia. Liberia, Somalia, in Uganda's case, and uh, Rwanda, always, yes, anything of a regional and Pan-African nature, Rwanda always get engaged in. So this becomes a golden opportunity. Too many Eritrean Sudanese, they're here anyway in very large numbers. What do you gain? Um, valuable arms. Uh, what do you lose? Nothing. Porous borders. So win-win. More win for Uganda than uh, Israel. Israel, get rid of that inconvenience. But why the struggle over the refugees is the important point. Because, of course, it being Israel, there's already the tension between the, the black Israeli population, the Falashas, and you know, the, what you call the white population. Then, then Israel and the Arab Israelis. So when you bring in this group of Africans, you start complicating that awkward question of Israel. Yeah. Multicultural Israel already struggling. And then if those refugees, housing and all this, why them, and then how about the Israeli yeah. Arabs? Yeah. So that's the awkwardness that Israel faces. Absolutely. So, Raymond, let's talk about Uganda's refugee policy, described as one of the best in the world. Most receptive. Most world. receptive. We have about over what, a million refugees. 1.4 million, 1. 4 million yes. refugees in this country. Mm -hmm. Some of them from you know Congo, the others from South Sudan. You have all this, and 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 we, we, we have we are so hospitable a country. And sometimes I'm asking, aren't we biting more than we can chew? Is there more than meets the eye to this hospitality? Well, I don't think that there's more than meets the eye. I, I think that it's in the first of all we know what political instability looks like. Um, and also, everyone around us is fighting, so there's no chance that anyone would be running anywhere besides us. We are the most peaceful around a, a very porous area. Um, there's fighting in the DRC, there's fighting in Rwanda's 1994, there's, fight, there's fighting in Sudan. Um, there was uh, post-election violence in Kenya, which brought in refugees. So all around us, people are fighting. So we have no choice but to be receptive to refugees. What, however, beats the eye or what makes Uganda's refugee policy a little bit questionable is how come even with the local communities that are already overstretched on budgets and numbers, why are we still receiving more refugees from countries that have essentially settled down? Um, in other countries, the lifeline for refugees is nearly 10 to 15 years then you repatriate back to your country. Um, here, refugees could go on for as long as they can. Um, we have a tribe now that's recognized nationally, but started out as refugees. So uh, in terms of why the refugees, I think that we know what political instability looks like, but also we know how to score points from that political instability. Absolutely. Um, it's, it, it reads well on our foreign policy for people to know that we're very receptive. We just hosted a, a summit for refugees where the UN chief flew in yeah. and a lot of donations of money were made to look after these refugees. So in terms of a foreign policy, it looks good on our papers. But it's also the spirit of the leadership here. It's born out of circumstances that understand political instability. So they, they very easily relate to political instability and refugees. Uh, than many other leaderships, of course. Absolutely. Um, Tim, do you agree with Raymond's submission? Well, I could add a few spins to that. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, Uganda is not as densely populated as Rwanda and Burundi, the two most densely populated countries in uh, Africa. Uganda is a fertile country. It's just the inverse of Kenya. 80% of Uganda fertile, only 20%, you know, semi-arid. There is, seems like it's a small country, but it's, there's just so much space uh, here. And even beyond the present uh, 70 government. It's been, as I said earlier, historical for Uganda to seek to punch above its weight, to entangle itself in regional matters, um, be it matters of the Nile and uh, the South Sudan um, intervention in 1977 when there was a civil uprising in the Shaba province in the then Zaire by Idi Amin. The engagement of Uganda in Congo in the civil war in 1965, and Ugandan troops go there, and of course are accused of uh, smuggling ivory and gold. 
Um, look at any direction, uh, Uganda's staunch support of the African National Congress during the anti apartheid struggle and the placing of camps in here. Several of these uh, ANC leaders, including, if I'm not mistaken, even people like Nelson Mandela, during their uh, uh, struggle did use Ugandan passports. That sort of thing. So Uganda positions is, itself as... Yes, it's always been one of the founders of OAU, but it's had that peculiar need to sort of like raise its hand every time the and call is made. Strikes. Yes, because it, ex it makes Uganda look uh, pan-African. It expands the profile of the leadership and the government. Um, it then, of course, doesn't come out empty-handed. It reinforces the strength of these governments because now next time there's an attempt to move the government here. People will have to think twice about think yes. that's, that's, the refugee policy, yes. the sending of troops to Somalia, S something peacekeeping missions. The, the kind of tact that Burundi uh, engaged in, in sending troops to Somalia. Burundi has no Somali population. It's a country in need of every soldier it can have <laughs> to stabilize its country. Why should Burundi troops go past uh, Uganda, Kenya, and go into Somalia? That's strategic thinking insert yourself into the UN and Western security policy in, the, in the, um, Somalia. Hutu president, Tusi army. If there is any attempt by the Tusi uh, dominated army to overthrow President Kuruziza, the first thought around Western capitals is our ally with troops in Somalia cool down that uh, so, so, so in terms of the geopolitical level, is, there is some sort of... It's not exactly charity. There is much to be gained from all this. Yeah, and, and the other thing that, Raymond, maybe I, I wanted to bring you, you know, to weigh in on this is that most of the refugees come into the country and, you know, we depend so much on donor, you know, donor funds that are coming through. We recently raised a lot of money at the, you know, the refugee summit, which is held here in Kampala. And so my worry is... Look at it this way. We're already overstretched. Some countries have not actually met their obligations. Uganda is still pushing that they honor their obligations. The budgets are getting tight, and yet we still open our arms wide to receive immigrants from Israeli. What happens if these donations come, don't come through? You know, already we have an overstretched budget. Aren't we just going to starve these people? I, I think uh, we need to look at the capital where the demand came from. Tel Aviv is a power capital of the world um, in terms of power brokering. If Tel Aviv made a request, you'd have to look at it twice, uh, whether you are the US and global power, whether you are uh, Palestine, whether you are Saudi Arabia. And I think that Uganda is, is no different. Tel Aviv has made a request. Can we have uh, some of the Eritreans and Ethiopians come to Uganda? The Ethiopians have an established community in Uganda. They, there's a whole Asmara community down in Kabbalah Gala. Oh, okay. Yes, so uh, it, 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 ideally for Uganda, a request coming from Tel Aviv would be, how do I benefit from this request? But what happens if the donors What trade-off do I make? Uh, if the donations pull out, what are we going to do with the, with the, with the refugees that we have? But I also think that we know scarcity a little bit more than anyone else in the region. I think that we have learned the art of surviving on little or no budgets, because many of our budgets are largely stolen and misused, misappropriated. Uh, I don't think that there would be a worry if, if donors fail to come through. But again, back to the refugee scenario, the Israeli ones particularly, there's money that comes with them. Each of them is given at least three, three, uh, yeah, three thousand five hundred dollars. At the time we found in 2014, they're getting three thousand five hundred dollars. Come back to Uganda, and that's like startup capital for you, as you figure yourself out. All right, I'm, I'm just worried. And I posted something on Twitter, and I said, yes, we're a hospitable country, but aren't we overstretching our resources? Can't we? Don't we like have a a stop, like, you know, at this point we cannot get in more. I mean, we have Kenya, we have Tanzania, okay, like we have other countries within the region that can sort of open, it, open their doors wide to get the, you know, the, the refugees in. You make it sound like the one million Eritreans on S South Sudan is about to flood Uganda. How many are they? About 1.4 refugees at least. How many to be deported to Uganda? The ones to be... No, it's about Uganda. like, what, 200, 200 but Israel I mean, says... I'm really 200. Um, 200 could comfortably fit in some uh, sports venue or, you know, uh, it's some Jera and all this. In other words, the point is this, 200 
is drama. It makes Israel look racist and reinforces all the prejudice against Israel. But 200, I mean, Eritrea, if you understand that country's history, is, to cut it a long story short, there is this compulsory military service that just doesn't seem to end, that's become indefinite. So many of those are university students, people who are not being uh, hunted by the government, but essentially just tired of that uh, enforced conscription, conscription. So they're not refugees as in being sought after by the regime. It's very much this typical refugee, the, the refugee in search of opportunity rather than the refugee, refugee fleeing for his life. So 200 Eritreans but, but uh, look at it this will way blend too. very we comfortably. We still open our borders to South Sudanese refugees coming to the country every day. You have Congo. As I said, Uganda is like, small geographically, but it's, it's a very fertile country. It's sort of like, uh, you, you know, the laid-back culture of Uganda. There's none of these uh, tensions over land, let's say, in countries like Kenya and, and such, or let's say Egypt. So Uganda can take uh, even like another two million, provided, of course, the international community meets the bill, which eventually they will. Now, Israel itself will very gladly uh, send that money to Uganda. 200 refugees is just not much. Israel. I think GDP is about 104 billion or something dollars. This is a minor matter, in other words. It is so little for Uganda. As I said, 200 refugees, even if there were 2,000 or even if there were 20,000, those would very comfortably blend into Uganda, vanish into the Ethiopian Eritrea community in Kampala for what it's worth. And then, like I said, the Ugandan. Uh, presidential guard, the Special Forces Command, is trained, equipped by Israel. Those arms are such a great asset to Uganda. Uganda. They are more than compensate, and all the intelligence uh, listening posts and whatnot, and the tapping of our phones, if I can uh, uh, risk uh, discussing such matters here on TV, are more than compensation for sacks of uh, wheat flour for 200 <laughs> refugees. Let's Timothy, just be. <laughs> Timothy Kadija, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. Raymond Mujuni, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you guys for the thank conversations so that we've had tonight. Well, um, Yusuf, you've just heard it from uh, you know, the gentlemen here, and they seem to be focusing on the issue that you know, Uganda is still open and we can still accommodate more refugees. But as I said, we want to say that um, the Netanyahu administration has collapsed all the deals to repatriate African immigrants into Uganda. That's just the latest from Tel Aviv, and you've just had the gentleman weighing in. Back to you, Yusuf. Thank you very much, Solomon Serawanja, for that detailed uh, conversation about the refugee influx in Uganda. I'm sure most Ugandans are reprieved because already Uganda has more than a million refugees. Most people are concerned, you know, with those 500 extra that were supposed to be added from Israel. Many thanks, uh, Solomon, for that. And before we end our 